Thanks again for having me speak here. We're gonna talk about being a little girl geek. So uh, we're gonna talk about how fun it is and what the joy is of working with youth and how that is important for, for not only you, but your career, your well-being, um, your sanity at times, and society in general. So are you guys ready for this ride? All right. Okay, so since we've been sitting for a little bit, I'm gonna make you stand up. Stand up, please. And let's see if we can, uh, yeah, stretch out a little bit. Stretch out, it's good, good. Let's see if we can uh, chew gum and walk at the same time. So I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor and close your eyes, all right? And think about that first geek moment, that first time you came across technology and it was magical to you. It doesn't have to be a technology geek moment. I know some people geek out on cooking and clothes and all that, so it's okay. Uh, but that first geek moment, all right, so you have that. Now, how are you feeling? Are you feeling delight? Are you feeling curious, anxious? You wanna know more? All right, great. Well, you can open your eyes and sit back down. Thank you. And so this is my first geek moment. As you heard in the introduction, uh, I began coding at six, which is pretty ripe age for being a child of the 80s. Um, I was known as a child that liked to take things apart Heaven forbid give me a screwdriver because everything in the house would be undone. Um, I actually got kicked out of preschool because they wouldn't let me play with needles. Um, and so let me explain that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I like to make the world my own. So uh, my mom taught us how to sew clothes for our little uh, stuffed animals. And when I got to preschool, I just thought, well, why can't I just make my clothes for my animals? And apparently that wasn't acceptable. And well, I had to wait till I got to kindergarten to go back to school. Uh, but Anyways, you can imagine that this uh, first programming experience where I open this book and the character in the book looks like SpongeBob, it looks like a cartoon. And in the first sentence it says, I can be the master. You can tell the computer whatever you want to do. And I'm like, oh, all right, this is, this is awesome. Um, and that was my first program. That's it, just one line. That's all, that's all it took and I was hooked. Um, and so this, this book led me through building games and little by little I gained confidence and I was building my own world. I, had, I, didn't, I, needed to, I didn't need outside friends, I was building this computer friend of mine. Um, and so uh, I went on to uh, go through school. Six, six year olds have a short attention span, right? So I didn't see programming again for 10 years, not until high school. Thank goodness my high school had a computer science class, uh, but 10 years did pass, uh, and that's when I saw programming again, and I saw that it was the same language that I had seen when I was six, and I was like, all right, that's good, I'm hooked. So I went on to study uh, UC San Diego. Any Tritons in the house? <laughs> all right, yes. Uh, so I went on to there, and I went on to have a, a great career in technology, and I was one of those underrepresented minorities, those ERMs, that didn't really know she was one because when I learned about technology, I was so young that I didn't know any stereotypes uh, that were attached to it. I didn't know any biases that were attached to it. Um, I just knew that being a geek was the coolest thing in the world and I still think that. And so, you know, I was like, I don't know what's wrong with everyone else, but I'm having fun. Uh, so, but people say, well, Jen, that was 30, I'm gonna age myself, 30 years ago, you know, now computer jobs are everywhere. Now everyone is taking classes in school to learn computing, I mean, that's the future. Um, your story is old, you know? That, that's not today's kid's story, right? <sighs> Wrong. So I'm gonna take you through some statistics of computer science education K through 12 right now. Um, so you see on the right, that there's uh, how, many, how many students are, are out there right now in K through 12. Uh, and 74 percent of the K through 12 kids are in elementary and middle school. And we can't even break down how many percentage of those kids have computer science programs because it's so negligible that we can't even measure it. So of the high school kids, uh, which is this 20, 25 percent, uh, only 4% have a computer science class in their high school. And computer science here can be defined as word or typing. It doesn't necessarily even mean programming. So we're, we're stretching the word here. 
Um, and only 2% take AP computer science, uh, that they have that in their, in their high school. Um, and so on the left, we break it down into California. And in California, uh, where the school system is 50% Latino right now, um, and you can see 7% African American and the rest, and it's about half female, uh, on the right, you will see the AP computer science exams. And look at the mismatch here. You know, only 7% Latino, 1% African American, and only 21% female, uh, compared to the 50% of the school population. And across the country, it's 19%. So it doesn't look that great. Uh, so now let's move up the educational chain. You know, maybe it gets better when you get to college, right? There's, there's more females in computing. Well, not so much. Uh, you'll see last year about 12%, 12.9% graduated with bachelors uh, in computer science. This is women. Uh, and in the last 10 years, there's been this huge decline, whereas in 1987, there were 37% of women were graduating with computer science degrees. And so what's going on? You know, what, what's happening here? So now you move into the workforce. And this is awesome. Take this in, look around, look at all the beautiful uh, women here and supporters of women in technology, because this isn't what your workplace looks like, is it? No, it's 26% uh, women, 3% uh, African American, 4% Asian, and that's right, I'm the 1% Latinas <laughs> in computing. <laughs> um, I wish I was rich 1%, but that's what people think when I say the 1%. I'm like, no, I'm wrong, wrong type. Um, so, one day, one day. Uh, so, so, what is happening? Why is it that, that, that folks, underrepresented uh, minorities and women, are not going into computing? What are these deterrents? So, irrelevant curriculum. I think back in my school, I have a database professor who's still using 40s Italian movies in his examples. Okay, students don't know what that means. That it doesn't engage them. So you need to bring a curriculum that is real world. Uh, Lecture-based instruction instead of project-based. So what do we do at school these days? I tell you a bunch of stuff, you write it in your, your notebook, and then you regurgitate it on a test. All right, that's, uh, that's great, but it doesn't keep the learning, uh, it doesn't settle the learning in you, and you don't continue your education that way. That's not how we work in the real world, we're project-based. Teaching styles that discourage collaboration. Well, that's what I just said. Instruction, are you collaborating with each other when you're uh, being talked to? Not really. Um, and females specifically really like to collaborate and work in, in projects. Failure-proof environments. Anyone here ever write a program of, subs of substance that worked on the first time? <laughs> no? I mean, that is the basis of computer science. It's trial and error. It's the basis of STEM. It's actually the basis of life. I mean, no one started walking right away. No one started talking right away. You have to do trial and error. And if the classroom or the education environment doesn't allow for that, well, then it doesn't align with how you're going to become once you become a professional in computer science. Absence of role models. So I actually heard this morning on NPR, what's the problem? Why aren't there more women in technology? The problem is, there aren't a lot of women in technology, therefore not a lot of women want to become technologists because they don't know that they can become technologists and this is this bad cycle. Um, and so that leads to limited visibility of what we can do in our careers. And computing career perception is still that dorky um, male, white male here in the US that is the, the hacker, the coder. So I know I just brought you guys down, I'm sorry. So are we doomed? You know, this little girl wants help. She wants to be a geek. Uh, but what if we could have a place where there's gender diversity, there's uh, gender balance, you know, there's uh, diversity of culture, diversity of ages, diversity of, of all the ethnic backgrounds, racial backgrounds. Would you guys want to be in that place? Yeah? All right. Well, the future is now, actually. And I'm going to show you a little video of something that I came across, and it rocked my world, changed my world. So let's see here. Uh-oh, that's not working. That's all right. Oh, all right. All right. 
Well, I'll speak to it. It's fine. Um, yeah, so basically, um, I went to Austin, Texas to an education conference. And I was talking to this lady and she was telling me how in her classrooms she builds a platform for doing game design and development. And I'm like, no way, that can't be, you know, that's happening in the classroom? She's like, yeah, this is happening in the classroom. Why don't you come visit a classroom? So I go check out a classroom and uh, it's all right. It's okay. um, and so I go and first of all, this school has to be cool because there's camels outside of the school, all right? That was, that was pretty phenomenal in the first place. Um, and this is in Texas, so apparently Texas and camels have something to do with their history. But uh, I don't know, any Texans in the room could explain that to me later. Uh, so I go into the classroom and you see these kids sitting in groups, they're project groups, and they have actual animation and actual code in, on their screens. It isn't drag and drop, this is like the real deal. And they're eighth graders. And what is fabulous about this is that uh, there's 50-50% when it comes to, to the females to males. Um, and they're paired up with their local nonprofits. So I go and I talk to one of the groups, and it's this group of girls, and they're working with MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And they are building apps for this nonprofit. They're building these anti-drinking apps where, you know, this person has a little too many and just kind of falls down and you gotta keep them, you know, sober and whatnot. Um, and how fabulous is that, that in eighth grade, 13, 12 years old, that you are able to help your community just with the skills you're learning in school. I mean, you're able to take from the classroom immediately out to your community and do something there. Um, and so I was just, floored by seeing this. And, and so I thought, okay, well, if this is what it takes to do it in the classroom, let's figure out how do we make this happen for, for everyone. And mind you, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been in STEM outreach for a long time um, with workshops, uh, after school programs, but I'd never seen anything in the classroom like this. So I went along to figure out to go to different classrooms because maybe this was just an anomaly. So. I checked out a classroom in New York City. It was an all-girls public high school. Uh, I don't have the picture here, but I went to this high school, and there they're teaching Spanish and different subjects by building learning games. Uh, and I, all I did was give them a little bit of my background, what I do, that I'm an engineer. And it warmed my heart that after I talked, one girl came up to me and she's like, I want to be an engineer, or I'm going to be an engineer. I'm like, oh, that's great. And she's like, but I don't think I can afford college. And I'm like, well, don't worry, I'm here for you. I'm gonna send you all this scholarship information and you're gonna to go to college and you're gonna do well and you're gonna change the world. And that was just by giving a little bit of my story. So then I went to some classrooms here in San Jose Middle School, which you see here on the top left. And here are some girls that were building a uh, makeup and fashion app. And it was so cool. You walk into this virtual store and they, uh, they're so proud of it. And when you talk to them, they're talking like computer science professionals. They're talking like game designers, game developers. And again, this is seventh grade, right? I mean, imagine having that. That would be amazing. So I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna bring CS to the masses and classes, and how are we gonna do that? Well, being the good product manager that I am, I have to understand the users, the user, how, how they work. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna go be a teacher and I'm gonna go teach computer science. And I'm just gonna pick high school because that's, that's where the openings are at. And so I joined a program called Smash, Smash Academy. We actually have one in the crowd today. So yay, Leilani's here, so one of my students, um, A students. Uh, and this, this program is five weeks on a campus where they have to take five days of rigorous STEM classes. They get to live in the dorms. It's basically a preview to college. And so I was able to teach computer science uh, to 70 scholars, so three different sections. Um, and it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I don't know if you've taught teenagers, but besides the hormones, the, the identity problems, and their, their addiction to their devices. I mean, if you unplug their headsets, it was almost like unplugging them out of the matrix. It would like fall apart. Um, I, was, I was surprised I was able to get a word in edgewise, but I was. And the funny thing is that I was able to bring all of me to this classroom more than I can bring myself to work. Um, and I hadn't had any teaching experience, but I had experience leading engineering teams. I've had experience 
leading a team towards a ridiculous release deadline and motivating people. And those are the skills that you can use in the classroom or when you're working with youth. So uh, are you guys ready to take a little mini lesson? Yeah. All right, so is anyone here a raw base? It takes two? <laughs> so you want to rock right now? You want to get down? No? Oh, you're not raw base. Well, maybe not today. Uh, so this is how I taught uh, conditionals in my class, uh, if-then statements. Anyone here learn their if-then statements like this? No, not really. Imagine if you could have. I mean, how much more fun would that have been? Uh, so like I was saying, in, at work, it was hard for me to be too girly when you're in a team of all boys. It's not like I can go off about going to the spa and whatnot. Um, because it's not super diverse, I can't flip into Spanish, flip into English, flip into genbonics, well, that's my uh, language because I'm kind of a hip-hop head, um, without people looking at me weird and not understanding. But in this classroom, I was able to bring all of that to this class because these kids were me, you know, many years ago. And so I'm just modeling what I wanted to see in, in their world. And one of the things that is great about working with kids is if you see behaviors that you know are not gonna serve them well, you can kill it right there. If, if a girl says, I don't think I got it, I'm like, no, you got it, and this is how we're gonna do it, right? Um, or you see people not collaborating, you can get them to collaborate. You see the boys going to one side and the girls going to the other side. You make them work together. And if you get them to do that at middle school and high school, how do you think they're gonna grow up? How do you think they're gonna be as a professional? Great. So here are the benefits once you, uh, once you boil them down. So just showing up is enough. Uh, you don't really have to teach. Just showing your face that you exist helps inspire folks. If you can engage and get the attention of a teenager, then kudos to you. That means your facilitation skills are amazing and the mastery of your craft is, is getting better. Uh, you become a better learner and a better problem solver. There were times where I played dumb, and now you know my student will probably see that. Uh, these are some of my tricks. Or I just said, I don't know. You tell me how it works. And then we become co-learners, and they teach me how to problem solve. And that's just amazing there. Uh, they inspire you more than I think that uh, I inspired them. So I also got to teach entrepreneurship because I told the students that I'm not going to teach you how to just make things. I'm going to teach you how to sell them too, right? Um, and so I got to listen to these wonderful ideas that came out, out of the youth. So one of them, I had just shown them I'm a neuro gadget freak. Like I wish I could control everything with my brain and eventually we'll get there. Um, I just showed them a little bit of that. And from that, I got an idea of swallowing a pill that has all the world's music in it and somehow that digests into you and then it gets into your brain so you can just listen to your music in your head but get this your eye color changes when you're listening to the music so that people know you're listening to the music now, how cool is that now i started geeking out right now oh, you could use nanobots and you could do this and you and you know i'm just sitting there geeking out with this kid and, and that was the beauty of it right okay so there's that and then you're changing the world to what you want to see. You have the power to do that. Today, tomorrow, at break. <laughs> uh, so now that I've got y'all juiced, how do you get involved? Obviously volunteering for programs, and I'm gonna give you a slew of them in a second. Uh, ask your company for financial support or in-kind support of in-school programs and after-school programs. Be a mentor. There's programs out there like Technovation Challenge that are looking for women in technology. And then advocate for computer science certification and standardization across the board. All right. And so these are a few organizations. Actually, these are all the ones that I work with. There are hundreds more, um, but these are just a few. Hopefully, you've heard of some of them. Um, but I'd be happy to share with you uh, more organizations on how to get, get into this uh, more. Um, so in closing, I see the world as a ginormous playground. So you, you guys to me are not my colleagues, you're my playmates. Uh, when I work, I don't work, I play, right? And to me, age is nothing but a number. Our youth has so much promise, so much to give, they just need an outlet, they just need a voice. So what I'm asking you all is that 
you find your little inner girl geek or inner guy geek and allow them to play. And you're gonna just have so much fun the rest of your lives. So thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Does anyone have questions? We have time for about one or two quick questions. Wait for the mic, please, because we're catching it on video, so we want to make sure that we hear the question. No, no worries. <laughs> um, so something you said earlier about your trick when you're teaching kids playing dumb and saying, no, I don't know. That was always like a big pet peeve of mine in school whenever teachers would do that, and I would say, well, it's like this, right? And they go, I don't know. I would instantly back up and go, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know, I'm not right, that's incorrect. Like, he just keeps saying, I don't know, is it, is it? Like, and I keep hearing in my head, you're not right, keep going. And what he was you know, trying to do is challenge me when the whole time I was right, but I'm, my confidence is just shrinking the more he does that, it was like, Oh my God, just frightening, and I get you know chills even thinking about it. But yeah, um, I don't know. How do you even like overcome that or deal with it? Right. So you're right. I've I've run into students that had similar behavior where they would just back down. Well, in in, in work in general, we're collaborative. I used to tell the students, I'm all look, you're all a collaborative brain. Okay, so use all your brain power to figure out the answers to the questions and the puzzles that I'm gonna give you. So when a student started to back down, I would ask her peers to help her and like, you know, cheer her on, like, is she right? She, you know, and then it was a team effort, right? And also, I wouldn't just leave them hanging like, well, we're not going home until she figures it out. No, you know, I, I, you help, there's a process of, of weeding out those, those tidbits, and the whole point was to, to get the confidence. You know, if you answer me in a question-like manner, I'm, I'm gonna be like, well, did you ask me a question? Are you telling me, or what's going on? And the same thing happens in the workforce, right? So I'm trying to instill those, those behaviors early where it's, a, you know, it's fine to do that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, I was out of the room for a minute, so I hope this wasn't asked before, but I thought your pie charts about the AP computer science classes were really interesting. Why do you think that only 2% of high schools offer the APCS class? So that's a really good question. Um, something that I really want to figure out myself. Um, if you see the, the enormity of need for folks that are uh, trained in computing. And by the way, I'm not advocating for everyone to be a computer science person. I just think knowing how to code and knowing technology is important because you're going to work with engineers in the future and it just will help you in your career in general. One of the things, there's, there's a lot of barriers out there. There's uh, infrastructure. So to have really good classes, you have to have good infrastructure, like good Wi-Fi, good systems. And I'll tell you just from the five week program I was in, we were frustrated by our systems. And that sucked because people would think, oh, computer science is not that great. And I'm like, no, it's because your computer is not that great, not that computer science isn't that great. Um, so there's infrastructure, there's, uh, there's money that is just not easily allocated across, uh, or evenly across the country, there's that. One huge, huge barrier is professional development. People, having enough people that are uh, trained to teach. And this is one thing where you all, I didn't put it up there, but you guys can contribute as well, is in the, in the education of instructors and educators. Uh, you can help them, because there's, there's not enough of them. And so if you don't have enough people teaching computer science, then it's hard to teach at those higher levels. Um, so that's, that's some of the problems. The other problem, um, I'll tell you from my day, and it's happening now, is that sometimes the AP computer science test doesn't count for college, and so, people may not be, uh, want to take that. I myself uh, staged a walkout of my AP computer science test uh, because I found out that it wasn't gonna you know, count for college. And being a good engineer, which is a lazy engineer, I was like, no way am I gonna spend my spring afternoon taking a three hour test that doesn't count for anything. Um, so there's a lot of gaps there that 
that's, that's a great question. I'm going to hopefully come back with a better answer soon. And you can help me too. All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Really appreciate it.